Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Samantha Bates from Ohio State and Coach Beyond. We are so excited to welcome you for this kind of lunch and learn today. This is, you know, we're upwards in our second year of webinars, have had tons of amazing guests, and today is going to also just kind of move the bar, right? We have three amazing um, leaders in sport, and we're going to talk about the status of coaching for women and girls. So really quick, these are some of our kind of goals for our webinar. We want to discuss the importance of coaching female athletes and supporting women in sports, particularly female coaches. Um, we're going to talk with this team about some of the helpful or best practices that they've learned in their experience. You know, what are some of those techniques, strategies that can help uh, female coaches be successful in their roles, but also coaches who are coaching female athletes support and facilitate both life skill development and sports skill development of their athletes. So just to frame why we are talking about this today, we have certainly had a lot of focus on women's sports. It is growing, but we also know that we're seeing some statistics around ways that we can help and continue to grow um, female student athlete leadership. So just some framing, we have about 50% of high school girls who report feelings of sadness or hopelessness. Um, and this is in comparison, right, to about 29% of high school boys. Performance anxiety, anxiety in general, we know right now is much higher among our female high school young people. And this actually a lot of data is pointing to that student athletes are also experiencing comparable risks. Um, some leadership challenges, right? About half of all girls report that they're afraid to lead because they don't want to look quote unquote bossy, which we've known about that as a gender stereotype over time. Um, and then 79% of girls are experiencing immense pressure both in the athletic and academic space. And so we really need to think contextually about how to support this female student athlete group who's often really high achieving in multiple domains, but also matched by perhaps a lot of pressure. Comparably, we have some interesting trends happening in uh, women's coaching. So high levels of stress, about 73% of female coaches are reporting they're moderately, very, or extremely stressed. So we want to think about structurally what can help female coaches be successful. Um, we are seeing challenges around retaining female coaches. So about a 10% difference in the number of female coaches who want to come back each year and coach, which is concerning. Are they not getting enough support? What can we do to keep retaining them? Because we want to get this number up. We want some equity in terms of our women representation. Um, only about 41% of head coaches for women collegiate sports teams are women themselves. And so there's a disparity here in women coaching women. So I know my esteemed panel is going to be really excited to talk about all of these things and dig in. So without further ado, I'm going to intro them and then we're going to get to the discussion. So first up is Dr. Courtney Boucher, a feminist scholar who examines hiring practices and the organizational culture of college athletic departments and the impact this has on women and leadership in sport. Um, PhD in kinesiology, specializing in sports sociology. Boche is now an assistant director of research and programming in the Tucker Center at the University of Minnesota on research on girls and women in sport and is teaching in the School of Kinesiology. We know you wear a lot of hats, but your primary primary responsibilities are kind of managing that Tucker Center's initiative, Coaching Her, which is a great training. So those on, if you haven't checked that out, please do. Um, and organizing community events, such as a women's coaching symposium, and is super passionate about creating spaces where women feel seen and valued in sport. So Dr. Boucher is with us. Thank you for being here. Next for up is... Yeah, Jennifer Peterson, who works at the Center for Leadership and Athletics at the University of Washington, teaching multiple undergrad courses, probably grading just like me this week, um, and is supporting a really great initiative called Coach Up, um, one of their Washington grant projects. Prior to joining the staff, uh, Jennifer spent the past 20 years teaching, coaching, and training with an emphasis on health and fitness, youth-specific training, and athletic development. Um, most recently, she was an athletic director at Franklin High School there in Seattle, Washington, um, been teaching in Seattle public schools, as well as coaching at the University of Punjab Sands at Seattle University, and is also a certified strength and conditioning specialist and national board certified teacher. So thank you, Jennifer, for being with us today. Great to have you. 
All right, and last up is our very own local to Ohio, Victoria Jones, whose resume I'm about to list off for y'all, um, has coached women's uh, basketball for 18 years and served in education and athletics for over 22 years, various positions and backgrounds. Let me give y'all the rundown. A native of Dayton, Ohio, Victoria was a four-time All-City District 15 All-Star when at Patterson. She earned um, NJCAA All-Academic Honorable Mention at St. Catherine College before joining, joining the University of Dayton Lady Flyers. And Dayton is still in the tourney, so we're cheering for those Flyers. Um, following her collegiate, co collegiate career, Jones played semi-professionally for Plano, Texas Lady Eagles, and she has been coaching at Cincinnati State, Murray State, Eureka College, and Sinclair Community College. In 2018, she was named the OCCAC Coach of the Year. So we got a badass woman coach on here. After all of these stellar accomplishments, I feel like, Victoria, just knowing you, I know you were someone who probably said, I want to use sport to give back. And so is now in athletic administration and is the chief of athletics for Dayton Public Schools. She serves 19 sports across nine different buildings, several athletic directors, and thousands of student athletes. She has spearheaded projects that have been recognized by the mayor and is really focused on building the community and supporting student athletes' academic performance. Woo, y'all gave me a rundown this morning, okay? So thank you, Victoria, for being here with us. All right, so without further ado, y'all, let's dig in. So I want to start with each of you, um, and I'm going to start with uh, Courtney. Tell us a little bit about you, your background, your organization, and what's your why for kind of focusing on coaching in women's sports? Yes, um, thank you so much for having me. So I come from, come to you from a snowy Minnesota. Um, in stereotypical fashion, I played ice hockey. And then after I graduated, um, I stayed at my alma mater and coached collegiate ice hockey for a few years. And I just had such a great experience of using sport as a vehicle to have larger discussions. And I thought, you know, the X's and the O's aren't really my cup of tea, but how can I use these conversations to um, really engage with the girls and women that I was coaching. So uh, I did my master's and my PhD at the University of Minnesota under Dr. Nicole Lavoie and, um, and now in, in the Tucker Center for Research on Girls and Women in Sport. So the Tucker Center is a, it's the first of its kind research center. It was established in 1993 that takes seriously the academic study of how does sport and physical activity impact specifically girls and women and then their families and communities. So we're housed in the School of Kinesiology uh, at the University of Minnesota, and we do all sorts of things. Um, as you said, like I wear many hats, uh, but our mission really is to how do we accelerate systems change? How do we make sport a better place for girls and women? And then um, that would, in theory, right, make it better for everyone. Um, and so we do this through research, education, and outreach. Uh, we have all sorts of different lines of research, but primarily around how do we get girls in sport and keep them in sport? How do we um, look at the status of women in sport leadership, particularly in college coaching? And then also what are the media representations that we're seeing of our female athletes and women leaders in sport? Love that. So really the why is like, let's build the system for women and girls to make it better for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I think the, the why is right. We all know on this call, the myriad of positive psychosocial, physical, psychological benefits that sport and physical activity have. And so how do we create a culture and coaches are a part of that culture creation to make this place a like accessible place where girls and boys and however you identify can um, thrive within, not just survive. I love that. Yeah, Jennifer, what about you? Tell us a little more about you and, and kind of your why for, for coaching around women and girls. Yeah, so um, I get asked about my career path a lot when I, um, especially when I speak with our, our grad program, I've had a really nonlinear career path. So I, um, you know, I've taught, I've coached everything from the K-12 youth sports space all the way up through Division One athletics. Um, everything from coaching softball to being a strength and conditioning performance coach and then an athletic administrator. Um, and so I've kind of made lateral and backwards moves and really just focused on trying to find a good fit um, as far as mission, core values, and who I am as an educator and looking for um, places where I'll feel supported, right? Like as a woman of color, being in the sports space, um, 
primarily in strength and conditioning. Lots of times where I'm in a department or walk into a room and I'm one of one. Um, and so wanted, especially early in my career, to feel like I had the support to really develop and grow as a professional, as a coach, as an educator. Um, and so, you know, I've been able to sort of just follow for the last 20 years at this intersection of sport and education, right? So working in public education, um, being in the private sector and in the collegiate space, also doing some private training on the side. So it's been really interesting to kind of mesh it all and to to navigate um not just like a, a strict linear career path, but it's offered some really unique opportunities for growth. Um, I've been able to work and surround myself with some really incredible women and leaders and, and advocates, right? So people who just support um, women in sport and women in sport leadership. And so um, I think, you know, that's probably been the biggest thing is just this affinity towards serving kids who kind of grew up in sport like me, right? Like lower income, first gen, um, really used sport as sort of a second family. It became part of who I was, a, a huge part of my identity. Um, and so trying to give back in that way and not just through coaching, but then through athletic administration and trying to make some change programmatically and systematically um, as far as like policies go, right, with eligibility and who we we create access for, who we invite um, into the space. And so I think now at the UW Center for Leadership and Athletics, I'm situated a little bit closer um, to be able to move that needle, uh, just some of the policy work that we're doing and, and research that we do um, in the youth sport space. So yeah, yeah I'm super that. excited to be here. So thank you for having me. Yeah, I love that you said, you know, trying to trying to align the core values, right, with what I want to do as an educator and specifically talking about being a woman of color and making sure that we're pushing the needle and that I've just heard you think, I was thinking ripple effects, the ripple effects of my experience now informing and supporting others. So that's great. Glad you're here. All right, Victoria, our local Dayton AD, talk to us a little bit more about your background and why you feel so passionate about supporting women and girls in sport. First, I just want to thank you for the invite, you know, it's always to link up with Coach Beyond and your group. And you guys did an amazing job. We're pushing this. So we all appreciate that. Um, mine, as we talked about earlier, I've been all over the place, too. But um, my, my true focus really has been education and athletics. But here currently, I'm the chief of athletics for Dayton Public Schools. And this is my fourth year. Um, it seems like yesterday, though. We've been moving a lot around here. Prior to Dayton Public, I was at Euclid High School in the Cleveland area for two years. And um, majority of my career, I was a basketball coach at every level from high school, junior college, division three. I think I did every division but two. So <laughs> uh, Murray State, go racers. I still love them. I, I had a lot of things that happened um, when I was in that town. So and I've been in the prisons before. So, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think. When you talk about my why, I think the word impact comes to mind. Mm -hmm. And I believe impact leads to change. And whether that's a positive or a negative, you know, there's going to be an outcome. I will hope that my body of work um, has exhibit positive, you know, but I guess it depends on which parent you talk to, you know. I, I like to be a little humorous on here if you're okay with that. Um, but I think what's unique when you approach the impact piece I think with my life, I was fortunate to actually be that student athlete. You know, I played for the Dayton Flyers. Um, I actually was an educator and a coach for a very long time. And now I'm an admin. So when I make decisions, I think about everybody at the table, mm -hmm. you know. And I mean, some may have, you know, two out of four or three out of the four. But, you know, I am fortunate that I've experienced all the roles. So I can holistically uh, attempt to look in all the lenses when making that decision. And when you talk about that impact piece, you know, you know that the decision that you're going to make is going to impact all those individuals. So um, I just hope that, you know, as I continue to go through this journey, that I am leaving a, a lasting positive impact on others. Yeah, I love that. We've, we've seen your work here in Ohio. I got to go out and train about 200 coaches out in Dayton. And you could tell, you know, when you walked in, Victoria set the tone with the music, with the culture, with the climate. It was a place you wanted to be. It like 
generated and emanated this sense of like belonging and like community. And I just was watching you as a leader and thinking, oh my gosh, what an amazing female leader and how rare it is that I see a woman leading in that space, quite honestly. So true testament to your leadership. Um, so I'm going to start with Courtney um, around kind of coaching girls, because we know that you're with the Tucker Center and they're really leading around this training, coaching her. I'm going to have you talk a little bit about that, but we'd love to hear from the research and the education and outreach that you are, all are doing. You could discuss a couple like best practices around coaching girls. What would you offer to our audience? Yeah, so what I would offer to your audience is taking coaching her. Um, I'm going to, I'll give the quick um, synopsis of, is we got a lot of emails at the Tucker Center, of like, how do we coach girls? And at first we're like, oh my, like, just coach, right? Be, be a good coach and, and that will serve you well. But what we realized was it was a lot of well-meaning um, dads and moms saying like, maybe this is different. If it's, if it's different, like, how do I do it right? And um, so what we did was develop a coaching curriculum completely online, completely free, made for the busy coach, takes 20 minute modules at your own pace, all of those things. Um, and we tested it to make sure that it works. And um, coaching her really gets at the the core of the girls and boys aren't inherently different, um, but we're socialized to be different, right? Because of the world around us. So uh, oftentimes when parents or coaches would Google, like, how do I coach girls? A lot of negative gender stereotypes would come up. They would say, you know, girls just want to be chatty. They're just there to, you know, be with their friends. They don't actually want to be competitive and like coming from a very competitive player I was like yeah right um and right so like girls can be aggressive and all these things so when they were googling um or looking at books or the other many myriad of places that you can find coach education resources it was reinforcing a lot of these gender stereotypes so coaching her really at the core of it battles those gender types and says right if we want to coach girls and we're specific on that population, right? Here's what we need to focus on. So some of those best practices um, are really identifying gender stereotypes and biases, being aware that we all have them. I have them and I study this for a living and that's okay. But once I'm aware of that, how can I reframe uh, those different gender stereotypes and biases that I hold with me? The other uh, different approaches that we think about is like honoring that when we're talking about girls and Coaching her is, it was tested with coaches of girls between 11 and 17, but it works for our college coaches. It works for our youth coaches. Um, and recognizing that not, not all girls are the same, right? Like we all have many different identities that we're walking around the world with. And how do we hold all of those different spots um, and things that make us us um, and, and coach that individual? Um, and then I think the other best practices that have come up, whether we're talking about coaching girls, boys, men, women, doesn't matter who, is that are our athletes meeting the three C's? So the three C's in coaching her are, do our athletes feel cared about? Do they feel like they have some choice? And do they feel like they have competence, right? Mm -hmm. So for our scholars in the room, this comes from the self-determination theory. And if we can hit those three C's, so many psychosocial benefits happen. And ultimately, girls will stay in sport and enjoy sport more. I love that. So just thinking about this self-determination, caring, yeah. choice, right? And competence. So yeah. are you showing me that you care about me, that I'm valued here, that I'm heard? Some choice, like, hey, do you want to do this or that? Or even how right. do we approach this? You know, what are some decisions we yeah. can empower athletes to take? And then I love the competence. I think too, as Coach Beyond, we're really interested too in the competence, not just in sport, but how are we developing competence around using our voice as leaders or giving feedback to a coach in a way that's productive, right? Um, and Absolutely. these are skills that like women and girls can take into the workplace, into school, into their personal relationships, right? Sure. Same as any boy or any other athlete could too. So yeah. I'm going to have Victoria and Jennifer kind of answer that question too, because I had it yeah. struggled throughout. You all have been working with women and girls or coaching. You know, what are some of those best practices that we can offer to coaches on the call that says, hey, these are best practices in coaching, but also if you're working with a female athlete, you can think about these things. I saw Victoria unmuted. Right yeah, there. I think I, I kind of echo uh, Courtney a little bit. You know, I think um, teaching the fundamentals, you know, sometimes we get, especially in, in our role, we want to fill the position. You know, but we, we really need to be attentional to making sure we have people that are knowledgeable to teach them because student athletes, they they do uh, monitor how much do you know as my coach. Mm -hmm. And when they know that you know enough, then they buy in a little bit more. Um, and then I would also add to uh, meet them where they are. 
you know, we, we are not the uh, for sale Marians right now, you know, and, and we're okay with that. But at the same time, you know, we have to probably do a little bit more to develop our student athletes. So, you know, being realistic with the group that you have, you know, I tell our coaches all the time, you may have a philosophy, but you may have to tweak that because your philosophy may not work with those um, individuals. Mm -hmm. And then um, my last thing would be that connection, coaching beyond the sport and building that family culture, you know, because at, at some point we're going to stop dribbling the basketball and stop, you know, spiking the volleyball. And are we teaching them life skills that they can take with them after they leave us? And after 18 years of coaching, my biggest rewards, and I've been a champion, you know, I've had all Americans, I've coached professionals, but my biggest accomplishment is graduation. And when they come back and say, coach, thanks, you know, they don't always get it in real time. Um, and even with our coaches, you know, um, we talk about veterans, we talk about young coaches, but professional development is huge too. Um, not only the little bit that we give them, but investing in yourselves too. And I think that helps with building your culture and your program. Yeah, I love that. Building the connection, making sure we're going beyond you as a coach, owning that you have to have the caring, competence, and choice built in too. I think it's kind of a two-way street. We have to give that to our athletes, but you also have to kind of emulate that. I, you know, I can always remember some of my best coaches would be like, I'm not really sure, but I'm going to go try to figure it out too. And Absolutely. I always saw that humility as like a great leadership characteristic. Um, and, and so you just appreciate when you have somebody who's authentic and genuine and trying to do the best thing by you. So, yeah. And, and I would add, we, we have some new sport offerings. So we have boys volleyball, and some of our basketball coach, they have taken on that challenge. Yeah. But to your point, they're looking at YouTube and or this and or that, and we're giving them support. So, and some of them are actually winning. You know what I mean? So, oh. so you know, invest in yourself, and, and when you don't know, be honest with that, and then go find that resource. I love that. Yeah, Jennifer, anything to add there on kind of the best practices in this space? Yeah. Um. First echo what um both Courtney and Victoria spoke about just that holistic development of. Um, you know, we're right now deep writing in a course about adolescent development. And so just understanding what they're going through physically, mentally, socially, emotionally, um, and that it's a lot and it's a lot outside of sport and it impacts how they how they show up in sport. And so um, just wrapping them with care, the relationship building piece that Victoria spoke about um, is first and foremost, how you know what an athlete needs. Right. Um, and then you know, we talk a lot about holistic development. So understanding that performance and well-being are intertwined and impact one another, right? They're not um, mutually exclusive. They're they're mutually reinforcing. And so um, when we can sort of wrap um, an athlete with support while also helping them become a better athlete, um, they tend to excel in both areas, both as an athlete, as a person, as a student. And so, um, you know, kind of taking that approach and then I'd also say just modeling, right? Like that's kind of one of our biggest assets as a coach, as an administrator, as a leader, um, how we show up uh, to care for them, how we show up to um, interact with others, our consistency in our approach, um, how we communicate and care for one another. All of those things are um, highly observable and really impressionable, right, on athletes. So um, just how we show up in space, being ourselves, not trying to be a different coach, but um, being who we are. Um, and and owning that identity and and letting our athletes know that it's okay to be individual and unique that we all are sort of one of one in a lot of ways so um and and letting them know that that you're valued and that you matter right like we need you in sport and we care that you're here regardless of your skill level right that's not what you bring to the table and so um making sure that they understand that feel included and really feel that every time they show up yeah, I love that. I love too that you started with the adolescent development piece. I think so often to uh, to Courtney's point, we sort of have this bias of like girls are just highly emotional and this is like kind of how they're generated. And when we actually go back to the brain development, both all of our young people who are in adolescence have a bigger amygdala. They have a bigger part of their emotional brain. Now, how they choose to cope with that again is really socialized. So we teach a lot of like maybe different groups can express differently or, you know, families teach this differently kind of socioculturally. Um, but at the same time, all the adolescent brain is kind of meant to feel that emotional spike first and then get to kind of more rational decision making later. And when we train coaches on mental health, we have a little card that says like the amygdala is bigger than the prefrontal cortex. So emotions, then rational decision making. 
And we kind of normalize the like, that's where they may go first. And that's totally normal. Um, and then, you know, we talk about the imaginary audience and that feeling of being a young person where you perceive that people are really watching you and thinking about you well long after, right, that that event is over. So um, I have an example. I still work in schools. It's like, oh, my fly was down last week. Everybody's still talking about it. And you really go to middle schoolers and high school and nobody's still thinking about they're all worried about themselves. But how do we help adolescents and especially girls kind of think about that imaginary audience and get some of that social anxiety, kind of help them find coping mechanisms. Um, Cause that can be something that I think based on our socialization, we can sometimes say like boys will be boys and girls will be emotive. And instead being like, wait, they're both coping differently but they're both highly emotional, right? Um, so Jennifer, I'm gonna kind of come back to you and, and transition us into female coaches. So I know you all are developing a coach training program specifically for female and non-binary coaches. Um, tell us why you're doing that and the importance of that program. Yeah, so this comes out of some research um, out of our center, looking at youth sport trends within our state, part of the Project Play uh, project. And so we noticed that there's a huge gap, right? And this is nationally, it's not just within Washington state, but there's a huge gap um, with women as coaches within our state in the K-12 space, but also retention. Um, and we wanted to sort of fill that gap in some way. We weren't exactly sure how we wanted to do it, but we had this great grant. And so we took part of that funding and we were like, okay, well, let's just allocate this to supporting women and non-binary coaches within school-based athletics. Um, we started it out, we're in the second year, it's a cohort-based model. We started it out last year and we learned a lot, right? Like obviously the first time you run a program um, from the ground up and you're kind of building it on the fly, um, you learn a lot. And so we are, we're, we have 30 to 45 coaches in each cohort across our state. Washington state is fairly large geographically. So obviously um, meeting in person all the time isn't um, possible. So we start the year at the very uh, beginning of the fall with an in-person training. It's like a one or two day workshop. We do some sessions around like coaching best practices, but also really unpack um, the underrepresentation of women in sports. And so they understand and sort of have some terminology to know what to look for as they're navigating, uh, especially for our young coaches. And then we go through the year with some like online engagement. We're using Canvas, like a learning management platform, um, but really it's not necessarily a training so much as it's like a shared learning community or like a professional learning community. And so the biggest thing that we thought of was we're spread out. And a lot of times, especially in our rural schools, our coaches are sort of siloed, right? So they're the only woman coach within their department or within their district. And so how do we bring all of these women together and feel, make them feel supported? How do we create networks that are strategic so that we can um, help them advance if they want to get into administration or if they want to look for a different coaching position or assistant coaches moving into head coaching? Um, and so we created this network and we have them meet in like monthly affinity groups. So they're split into like regional groups where they meet um, every other month, they're split into like sport related groups by season or like level middle school, high school, so that they can really unpack some of the challenges that they're facing within their area, within their sport, within their level, and then strategize within themselves. So what we've learned is that we don't necessarily need to just give them a whole bunch of tools. We sprinkle that in, right? Like we do some quarterly professional development trainings and workshops online. But really, we just need them to come together and communicate what strategies are working for them. What are the best practices that you're using within your teams and let them share their own resources together and start building those connections so that they have a, a strong network and feel supported as they move through their coaching career, especially those first three years when they're just kind of figuring everything out on their own. They feel like they're out there on their own, just thrown in the deep end. So giving them this really strong support network of women who are also trying to change the landscape of sport within our state, right? And want to retain other women. Yeah. So that's kind of the biggest thing with it. Um, we thought it was important that we address that gap within our state. And so it was one of the priorities with that grant that we wanted to address. 
Love that. So I heard you say like, we're building this network and almost peer to peer mentoring that just kind of organically happens. And it's not necessarily a, you have to stay where you are, but it's, we want to keep you somewhere in sports. If you want to move into admin and you consult with somebody who's done that or look at their resume and also think about navigating the space just with the disparities that exist, like what are some things or some common pitfalls or to Courtney's point, how are those biases show up? And Victoria's moved into leadership. So how might you be treated or how might someone respond to you differently? And how do you kind of assert and get what you need, you know, in this space? So that's really, really great um, coming out of Washington. So I'm going to have Courtney and Victoria kind of add on here. What do you all think are some key things? We talked about this network, mentoring, just building the capacity of women to know what to look for. I think then there's maybe less surprises too. Um, setting some expectations. What do you all think are some factors that can help women be successful as coaches? I think it really um, depends on the level. I think Jennifer hit a lot of them. Um, I know that when I was doing my dissertation, I was looking at how do women become successful and uh, stay within college coaching. And the athletic, we'd ask athletic directors like, hey, what are you doing to hire and retain uh, our women coaches? And some of them said nothing. And some of them had a very long laundry list of things that they were doing. They were going out there. They were hiring them. They were making sure they had, you know, the correct facilities. They had competitive budgets and recruiting that they had great family support and leave, um, all of those things. And I think well, and can especially like at that level, but within any of these, you know, youth organizations or club high school of like looking for uh, not only that mentorship, but like what we call sponsorship of making sure that the leader around you is willing to advocate and have your back and actually pick up the phone um, when things happen, because they inevitably do, right? That's sport. Um, so I think that that's part of um, the retaining within the profession, because it can be like really, really hard. Um, and then having a network that Jennifer's talking about, whether it be with other folks in your state, whether it be, you know, connecting at coaching conferences or et cetera, to have people to bounce those ideas off to really honestly feel like you're not alone in it. Because I think oftentimes it does feel uh, like a very lonesome, like I'm the only coach who has ever had this issue. And you certainly aren't, um, but it's really time consuming and emotionally consuming. So how can we use different folks within um, our space to bounce some of those ideas off? Yeah, I love that, that you did that study and you could clearly see the like, we're not really doing anything specifically. And then there was like this gamut of, of things that we could do or things we could bring to our yeah. awareness to support. And, you know, the stats we had up, like it's so important for all athletes to see women in leadership and see their Absolutely. leadership styles and their experience and expertise. And to Victoria's point, to be able to make decisions with everyone's lens, you know, included. And so I love that that was your dissertation. There's clearly some steps that folks can take to support women and, and retain them as coaches. Victoria, what do you think having been a coach and now an admin? Supporting female coaches. Yeah, I think it varies on different levels. Um, since I'm on a high school level, I think it's really simple is and it may be kind of plain, but support. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that support being visible, you know, that support and making sure we have the same resources as the major sports, as the boys. Um, that support with maybe having like um individual meetings, not just that run through the gym, hey, how you doing? You know, actually, what do you need? You know, um, because it'd be amazing what a conversation can do for you. And and I will also offer, you know, if I am a coach, I will probably connect myself with other coaches. Mm -hmm. I know as district ADs, we meet once a month. And again, when you hear, oh, I thought I was the only one going through that. You you know, it, it's almost like a counseling session, kind of. You know what I mean? Um, with not only venting to people that know how this works, but also, hey, this is what we're doing over here. OK, yeah. so how did that work? And did your treasurer approve it this way? And what did your superintendent say? You know, how did you go about, you know, your ticket prices? So that that support of people that know it versus somebody that's just outside looking in. So yeah. I found that great. And then from an admin standpoint, we started something here where we used to do like employee of the month just with my internal staff. And then I expanded it. So now we have um, employee of the month with our coaches, our site coordinators. And it's not just like a cheesy certificate. And here you go. You know what I mean? Uh, we do a like a spotlight video and we share it on social media. Now it's getting me in trouble a little bit, you know, because I'm like, well, my turn coming, you know, but to 
to know that we put you out there because everybody don't get to see you because they can't be everywhere. So just things like that. And even with that employee of the month, they get to get lunch on the chief. So you get to have some private time with me and you get to pick it. So I'm not just getting you four for four in the bundle. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. So those things, you know, I mean, it's not fixing all the problems, but when people know they feel appreciated, you know, they kind of go beyond for you when they know that you appreciate the work. Yeah, I love that. I heard you say, you know, we got to ask, like, how can I support you? It's such an easy question that we know will get a response and cause us to maybe have some more stuff we have to put forward. But I even think when we're coaching girls, supporting women as coaches, thinking about admin and, and supporting women and girls, that question of like, how can I support you? is huge. The second thing you said is there's kind of a group that convenes, which is kind of what Jennifer was talking about, of the importance of getting together and hearing from others who are in your position or can at least lend some insight or make you not feel alone. That's a big one, I think, in terms of retention. If you feel alone, like Jennifer, your rural coaches who might be the one of one as a woman, that can feel really like, why am I doing this, right? And also, if I'm not appreciated, you know, what what's my why to come back? Um, I know, too, I've I've been to the Ohio High School kind of big convening, and there's a group that gets together of all women athletic directors, I believe, and also athletic directors of color, which I love because we even think about this across intersections of identity and knowing how important it is to also, you know, connect with folks who may be experiencing um, things comparably. And then just this, like, let's acknowledge, let's acknowledge and appreciate those that are doing the work behind the scenes. I think when we think about retention, Jennifer, you said this too, there's a gap and are we appreciating and acknowledging the work that's happening among our coaches of all walks, right? So I love that. Um, Okay, I'm going to ask all three of you this question, then we'll get to Sid for for some questions from the audience. Um, If you could wave a magic wand, right, and tell coaches maybe to do this one thing regarding coaching girls. So a lot of folks joined us today saying, I female athletes want to support them. Wave that wand and say, you can do this thing. What would it be? It's a hard one. So hard. Um, I will say we've, we've stolen this from uh, Wellesley College um, and they say a world that's good for women is good for everyone. Uh, And so if I'm waving the magic wand, what I'm saying is like all of the sporting environments that our girls endure right or are within that the coaches make that a place where they can be authentically themselves so they are celebrated for making good passes or scoring but they're also celebrating for like being aggressive and like getting in the game and they're celebrated for being a good teammate um, and being caring and collaborative and all of those things so I think if we can create those environments as coaches where those girls feel authentically themselves where they feel seen valued and heard I think sport would be a lot better place for everyone Yeah, I love that. And you mentioned that kind of individualized coaching, like see them also as not just a team of girls, but girls with different needs and different ways that they may need support. I love that. Okay. Jennifer, Victoria, wave the wand for us. Yeah. So similar to a lot of what we've already talked about, that support and sense of belonging. I think if we can really just create that inclusive environment where they feel safe, but also feel valued and understand that their uniqueness is what makes them so special, right? Like, especially at that time when you're like, I don't want to stand out. I don't want to be different. Letting them know that that's what makes them so great and why we appreciate them so much, right? Like that's what you bring to the world that is so valuable and that's your contribution. And so to own that and appreciate that um, and how we can scaffold and facilitate that um, is huge. Yeah, I love that. It's almost like we we talk a lot about like identifying the strengths and acknowledging those. So every athlete on your team brings a different strength. And we talk about leadership and community, being brave, being social, you know, uh, there's all different strengths that members of your team bring. And so acknowledging those, promoting belonging through those. I loved you said inclusive. I think we have a lot of work that we can still do, especially as females and women modeling, being cooperative, not competitive. Um, because I think sometimes structurally we're kind of pitted against each other to be these women going for leadership or being highly successful. And what you realize is the more women that move into leadership, the more opportunities for other women. And so it's really kind of this like we're all on a ladder together and can be pulling each other up. Right. Versus kind of kicking each other off. Um, and I always have loved that analogy um, on our team. So, Victoria, wave that wand for us too around coaching. I think, yeah, I think for me. Um being truly invested, yeah. um, investing in yourself as a coach and your staff, 
um, invested in the student athletes and development for them. And um, I just think with me, and especially in, in my urban setting, you know, we don't pay that much. So you're not doing it to get rich. So don't waste time with interrupting these student athletes' lives because we, we lose sight of the platform that we have. And, and that's um, a big reason why I'm in the seat I'm in now. You know, my coaches, you know, they were very impactful in my life. And sometimes we are the only mom, you know, if, if it's a, a male coach that's coaching the girls, you are the only dad. And we spend a lot of time shaping their lives and we can either help them move forward and put confidence in them or we can tear them down. So don't be that coach or that leader where that kid is saying, man, I'll never do this again. Or my coach did me like this, you know, and those coaches that may be on here, be attention on how you coach a program, too, because it's kind of like that, that generational curse, kind of, because how you coach that person, when they become a coach, they're going to coach like you coach. So be yeah. careful with, you know, that precious cargo that you have in your possession. So I think that true investment be really in. And if coaching is not for you, it's okay. I don't want you coaching at my district. It's okay. Cause it's not for everybody. You yeah. know, it's not for everybody. So just truly been invested in your program, your students and yourself, you know, because you are the leader. So that's that. kind of my nugget for that. That's a good one. Invest, go all in. Right. And you kind of talked about this idea of like, you got to be thinking about that precious cargo. I think too, when you said you're the mom or the dad, it made me think about attachment and just like every child needs a healthy attachment to an adult, right? Who cares about them. And no matter what their background, like some kids have more of that and others don't. And as a coach, you have the potential, right? To really model healthy boundaries, what it looks like to care to Courtney's point, like how to build competence, how to like teach them a skill and then get better at it, which then teaches them when adverse things happen in life. Oh yeah, I started, I couldn't, pick a PK in soccer. And now I'm in the top five, you know, like I've learned something and been successful and sport can teach us how to adapt and respond to challenges. And I think right now what we're seeing is that women and girls can really flourish in this setting. And also it can address some of the risks that we're also seeing. So, all right, I'm going to pass it over to Sid. Give us some audience questions. Absolutely. We're getting so many great questions rolling in. So going to try to get to as many as possible. Um, the first question we have is, what is the greatest challenge, whether that's mental, emotional, physical, that you faced in coaching, you know, women and girls or in your specific roles? I'll and take I'll that one. I think yeah. for, for us, so we're um, multiple school district and um, how our structure can be, we have one AD to three schools. We have that model. And those that do the work, you know, that's very challenging. Um, that's challenging as an um, associate AD trying to take on that task, but also as a leader, because we do a lot of things outside of the sport. We do programs, who's in the jersey, you know, for girls and women in sports, where we're saluting a whole like program for that whole production. And I think balancing those roles, um, finding flex time, you know, we have vacation, but when are we going to take it? They can give us comp time, but if you can't take the vacation time, when can you take the comp time? So I think our challenge is that work-life balance. And I'm trying to be really strategic with trying to get that, um, you know, right for my district. And in fact, we're talking about some restructuring currently because of that, because we want to be effective and we want people to not get burnt out, you know, going into the second year. So that's been our challenges. But some of the things I've done, I mean, I've bought my staff so, so many dinners and lunches that I don't think they say thank you anymore, you know, because it's such a norm. Um, but, you know, we celebrate birthdays here, you know, and they actually get gifts. Um, we try to do team bondings just to kind of keep that morale together. But if I can say something where it's a challenge, it would be trying to balance our work life and our families as well. I mean, even today, I let one of my associates bring their kid to work. You know what I mean? So just find that flexibility. I used to be that leader, like, no, kids don't come to work, you know, but you, you try to value your your um your staff you are you are only as good as your your team so you you learn that you you start to tweak your your value system you know as you continue to be in different settings yeah yeah that's a great response and i'm hearing just like that balance of 
work and life, which I think everyone can relate to in a lot of ways. And then doing that, how can you integrate your life with your work, especially when you're so passionate about what you do? I'm going to keep us going just because we have so many coming in. So our next question was, you know, what advice would you give to coaches to think about how we can maintain and promote confidence in, you know, our young women, our girls that we're coaching in sport, um, even when we're not necessarily with them or like speaking directly to them or we're managing a whole team. So I'll let Jennifer, Courtney, y'all jump in on this one. I'm going to pass to Courtney because of her work with the Coaching Her program, which is incredible. And I, have, I just want to give you an opportunity to kind of speak to it. Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. Um, and I will throw some some links in the chat too on in terms of resources. But um, promoting confidence is such a great question and it's so hard to do. Um, and I think it does come back to like, what are you modeling on the field? Are you giving your athletes some autonomy and some choice within like, hey, you are now the leader in this space and now you feel competent about doing that. And how can we take these lessons that we're learning on the field, on the court, in the pool, right? And applying this to life. And I think having those explicit conversations about, hey, you know, like you stepped up and made the, you know, schedule of each station that each, you know, um, group was going to go to, like, you know, look how this applies actually within your school system or look at how you can apply this within your family structure um, and make those explicit links. And hopefully that carries over um, as well. Um, and we also talk a lot in another plug is one of the biggest parts of confidence um, around sport is around body confidence and how girls feel about their bodies. The number one reason that they drop out of sport and because sports are so like centered on like what our bodies look like and what they can do and all of these things of like girls become really, really self-conscious and self-aware, right? There's that imaginary audience of, oh my gosh, it doesn't matter that my throw in run really far. Like my arm flab looked weird. So like now I am hyper aware of that and not about competitiveness. So also like having explicit conversations with your athletes around um, both specific things about body confidence, but also just about like leadership competence in those different um, places and and being the one to model that through. I think too, you know, to add on what Courtney said, when we're thinking about confidence, it's really like that one-on-one -on -one with the coach of like, let's go through yeah. what you, we, we use a lot in coach beyond everyone thinks I'm a broken record, but the wins and lessons, right? right? There's like not a lot of losses. There's a lot of lessons in sport. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, kids can go back and kind of watch the film and think about one or two things they would do differently. And then they take action on that. Those are small grains of ways we can build confidence because we're able to identify an opportunity, think about our actions or steps we would take to get better and then actually execute those. And that can really build small levels of confidence. Um, and I think specifically for girls, we need to give feedback. We need to give direct and, you know, uh, instructional and both kind of the mentoring feedback to help them navigate both the sport and the social emotional elements too. So good question, Sid. Good questions from the audience. Let's take two more and then we'll have to wrap, get everybody out back to, back to work. Back to work. Absolutely. And I love what you're both talking about is mastery, right? How can I promote that you're mastering things? And then you can look back and see, oh, I'm mastering this. I'm going to pass it, Jennifer. I think these, I'm going to kind of combine two questions into one. What, they're speaking about more from the coaching lens. So I think this is a good one for you to talk to is, one, how do I start to find other female coaches that could be in my network, especially if it's not necessarily available to me at my school? And then any tips for like preventing burnout? We know burnout among female coaches, especially when you're feeling alone, is so high. So tips for burnout and just starting to build your network or find your people as coaches. Yeah, so I'm going to start with the burnout one. I think um, by creating sort of a network of support, so finding other women coaches, they don't necessarily have to be in your area. Maybe you come across and meet other coaches within your sport at the preseason tournament or during postseason or the preseason coaches meetings or whatever it might be. Maybe you're all district league meeting, um, something of that sort, and just making those connections there so that you have someone that you can maybe shoot a text and say, hey, I'm dealing with this on my team. Are you experiencing the same? Right. And just be able to kind of open that line of communication. Um, one, it's going to fill your cup when it's empty. And then the second piece to that is finding really great resources that you can go to. So part of what we do with Game Changers is I send out a weekly update and it's really short. It could be a podcast link. It could be an article, something that has to do with being 
a girl or woman in sport, being a woman in coaching, a woman in sport leadership, um, something just to kind of promote thought to remind you why you're there and why you're doing the challenging work. Um, and then we share a ton of resources. So coaching association, um, membership organizations that are specific for women in coaching, um, women leaders in sports, right? Like we use that one a lot. We send them to the Tucker Center just to fill them with places they can go to find answers and to find other support resources um, specifically for what they're they're experiencing and the challenges that they're facing. Yeah, we'll have to share all of this out with everyone after the webinar. So Jennifer and Courtney, the things you're talking about and sharing, um, Courtney, I would even say getting on the Tucker Center's listserv. I know you all do like a monthly newsletter, I believe that goes out that talks about opportunities for women to convene. Um, and then I would say, Victoria, you know, you know a little bit about, you know, women convening around Ohio High School athletics, and you may be a great resource to, to connect some of our local coaches to other women Um in coaching. So Sid, give us one more question, then we're going to wrap up. All right. So in looking here, we have one more question that came in the chat is, do you have any advice for providing support for female athletes, given the intense culture or the emphasis that's placed on performance and anything around, you know, discipline techniques that aren't necessarily punishment um, for female athletes as well? And whoever wants to jump in and start, go for it. So I'm going to start from like a, a physical side of this, right? As a strength and conditioning coach, the question I always get asked, well, how do we instill punishment without using running or conditioning or some of these like physical um, areas of our, our sport? And it kills me because I'm like, it's counterintuitive, right? We're trying to teach these young people that this is a part of your performance, your well-being, your health, and sort of longevity. So let's not do things that are punitive that are actually set up to help you later in life. Um, and so I think we can go back to where we started in this conversation. It's about our relationships and connections with these young people. So it's going to be different, right, for each athlete. What really sort of helps them click, what changes their behavior, what helps them understand um, the risks they're taking or what's wrong with their behavior or what they're doing. And so we have to build that connection first to know where to go, which isn't, it's not a one size fits all answer, which is the difficult part about it. But um, I think that's where we get the most benefit. Yeah. I would like to add, um, you know, when I was a coach, I, I had students that running didn't bother them. You know what I mean? All right, coach, how, how many suicides? You know what I mean? So I think to her point, you know, it depends on the student athlete. I would say some of our coaches, because we have a good mix of coaches here, some have exercise, and I don't know if this is good. I mean, I don't know if I'd rather my legs hurt than my mental be damaged, but some of them actually send them out quarters or half, like you're on the bench, but you're not playing this first half. Um, now that starts the conversation with, especially if you're a star player, why Victoria's not in the game yet? You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, she in trouble. You know what I mean? Now, mentally, I might be embarrassed, but, I mean, not running them with that that situation. So I think they try to be creative with that. Um, I mean, I had coaches almost want to cancel the games because of one or two people. And I'm like, we're not going to cancel the game, guys. That impacts the other opponents. That impacts my bus. That impacts my officials. So I think just finding some out-the-box ways of still getting your message across because the last thing student athletes want is to be embarrassed in front of their peers and to have me sit a half and we're about to play Dayton Dunbar. Like, are you kidding me? So just trying to find some of those ways. And again, um, somebody probably still find a negative in that, but that's still an alternative. I think quick to just touch on um, the first part of that question instead of the kind of punitive punishment part. Um, but the how do we how do we create environments that support female athletes when so much emphasis is on performance, it's on winning. And what we know from the coaching science is that if we can coach holistically, so not only we, we're coaches, we're competitive, right? We want to win. So coach for that performance. Um, but how also can we think about our coaching practices for coaching for optimal development and experience? Uh, because if we can kind of balance this triad of these three different things of both our performance, our development and our experience, our athletes actually have um, better performance and a more enjoyable time in sport. So the research backs you to try to create those environments um, and performance will uh, both go up and so will their enjoyment to sport, which 
is the whole point, right? Yeah, I love that too. I think there's a couple things around like it is what you value too. So if you're always just like going to dinner when somebody, when we've won the big game and we're not celebrating that we had a really great practice, we got our goal of so many passes. That's clearly teamwork. We're going to celebrate and acknowledge that we kind of show and reinforce that all we care about is the outcome of performance versus maybe some other values. So let's say if our team value is teamwork, well, how am I going to reinforce that? What's the norm? Am I giving out a weekly praise? Am I taking everybody to dinner when we've had a really great month of teamwork and collaboration and everyone's been included in the after weekend events? Like whatever it looks like, am I reinforcing when I see that core value done? Um, and then this is just me as a, as a social worker. You know, sometimes just putting it back on the athlete around discipline can be really effective. So if I say... Jennifer, you knew you're not supposed to talk to the ref that way during the game. That's the core value of our program. Tomorrow when we meet, I'd like to have three things from you of what you think is a you know comparable punishment or something that would fit the kind of what you did. And then have athletes, you've maybe thought of one or two things too, like Victoria, like I think you maybe get seven minutes out of the game or you bring one or two ideas, they bring two or three ideas and you land on something that's like, all right. You knew that wasn't what you were supposed to do. We've landed on an effective discipline that maybe the athlete came up with. And you'll even catch if they don't come up with things to scale, they're really not believing that like that's a core team value and that there's going to be a consequence. Um, so that's when you can reinforce it. They may also over punish themselves, which can also be something where we can kind of catch that over pressure and maybe some some negative self-talk or something going on. So it's kind of a cool opportunity for discussion. Yeah. Ooh, what a fun conversation, y'all. I wish I could do this every day at lunch. Uh, we are so grateful for your time. For everybody on the webinar, I'm going to throw up an evaluation code and I'm going to have Sydney drop it in the chat. So please tell us who you are and how this went today. Any feedback or things you'd still like to know? Um, we can take some questions back to this team, Courtney, Jennifer, and Victoria, and share those out. Um, if you are not already following our Coach Beyond listserv, also, I would encourage you to reach out to us at coachbeyond.osu.edu and ask for your email to be added. We, much like the Tucker Center, send out best practices around coaching, training opportunities, networking opportunities, um, and Victoria is on our team, so she's seen how all of that work has rolled out for the past two years. Without further ado, thank you, Courtney, Jennifer, Victoria, again. So glad to have a conversation on the status of coaching for women and girls. Webinar guests, we will be back. We're planning a next webinar on soccer with the Columbus crew. So stay tuned for that. And everybody have a great weekend. Thanks for being here.